Thank you, Dr. Fong. And here comes the first presentation of today. Uh, the title of the presentation is Yellow Peril Racism, Past, Present, and Future by Dr. Rousseau Zhang. Um, Dr. Rousseau Zhang is a professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University and author of books and articles on race and religion. In March 2020, Dr. Zhang co-founded Stop AAPI Hate, a coalition that was awarded the 2021 Rapid Award for Social Movement of the Year. Dr. Zhang also was named as one of the Time 100 Most Influential Pet Persons in 2021. And he also received the Game Changer Award from the Asian Society in 2022. Please welcome Dr. Zhang. Well, thank you, um, <laughs> Lotus Project, for inviting me. And glad to be here. Um, it's um, actually uh, also appreciate Rams. I grew up in the Richmond district, and I actually, a long time um, San Franciscan, see students from San Francisco State here, so I'm really glad this morning um, to join you. Thank you, um, Dr. Nomoto. Thank you, um, Dr. Lau Johnson, for um, introducing this topic. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, what's been happening with anti-Asian hate, and I've been thinking a lot about how it's been impacting our communities, how it's been impacting me, what's the source of the racism, uh, and again, um, its deleterious effects, especially around racial trauma, and then I'd like to share about how we're um, dealing with it. To start to give you a sense of what's happening in the community, um, we're going to have some people read some incidents of racism. And um, I want you to put yourself in their shoes, and I'm going to ask you to um, call out what um, emotions these incidents um, rouse in you. Okay? So. Okay, uh, the first scenario, um, so my roommate told me that the Chinese are filthy people who all deserve to die of COVID-19 and said it is no wonder all plagues spread from China. Uh, they said that the Chinese were selfish and horribly overpopulated and they should have issued a zero child policy so they could not proliferate. A man right outside the main Massachusetts General Hospital entrance yelled at me, why are, you, why are you Chinese people killing everyone? What is wrong with you? Why the F are you killing us? Uh, while I was at the grocery store, another patron referred to me as another one of those damn Chinese trying to infect everyone into communism. I received the following voicemail message. I just wanted to let you know that China has lost their best customer, America. Everybody in America is not going to buy Chinese anymore, so I hope that your country struggles and everybody has no money. I think it's pretty ignorant for your government not to protect that virus, to let that virus come out and ruin the world. Thanks, China. I was in line at the pharmacy when a woman approached me and sprayed Lysol all over me. She was yelling out, you're the infection, go home, we don't want you here. I was in shock and cried as I left the building. No one came to my help. Thanks, so what emotions does this stir for you? Just yell it out, please. Disappointment. Disappointment. Disgust. Disgust. Angry. Angry. Despair. My fight response. Fight or fight? Fight. Fight response. <laughs> Curiosity. Curiosity. Frustration. Frustration. Anxiety. Anxiety. So all the words you express are trauma responses, right? Even the fight response. And I think 
Currently, the Asian American community is going through a period of collective racial trauma. One in five of us experienced this type of racism in the last year. And with 24 million Asian Americans, that's 5 million cases of hate. Um, it's racial because they're attacking us, not because of they know us and really personally dislike us. It's simply by the way we look. And it's traumatizing because you actually already identified how the community's feeling, disheartened, angry, disgusted, anxious, and fearful. So I've thought a lot about what's driving this racism, how do we stop it, and <clears throat> I really think it comes from this notion that Asians are threatening the U.S. and need to be excluded and driven out, that Asians are disease carriers, and um, because of COVID-19, have been scapegoated for it. So I'm going to sort of share with you um, about the yellow peril and um, how it's been impacting the racism today um, and how we're responding to it. So the yellow peril notion is the idea that Asians are threatening the West, that we're going to invade and overcome the West. And as early as the 19th century, Kaiser Wilhelm had a nightmare about Japan rising from the East to overthrow the West. And he actually had a painting of his nightmare reproduced, and he sent it to every ruler in Europe, warning them that Christendom is being threatened unless they band together against Japan. So <clears throat> this fear of Asians um, is sort of balanced with this love of Asians in the United States. And so what I want to sort of highlight is that um, the fear of Asians in the United States has always been in tandem with this sort of love and desire for Asia. And it's sort of a racist love because what, you know, originally Columbus was trying to get to China for its riches, right? And Manifest Destiny was about moving to the West to get to Asia's riches. And so America's relationship with Asia um, is a love-hate relationship. And it started with um, the West, and we had the Opium Wars. But then the United States wanted to be different from England, even though the US profited from the op Opium Wars. And the US created and established the Burlingame Treaty in 1868. In that treaty with China, the US said, no, we're a democratic country. We welcome Chinese. We're going to protect Chinese citizens when they come to the US in exchange for most favored nation status. So in that friendly diplomatic um, relationship, my great-grandparents were able to come here to the US. Uh, my great-grandmother came in 1868, and my great-grandfather came in 1882. Open doors, Chinese welcomed, especially for their labor. And that's really the love for um, Chinese back then, is their cheap labor. But that love for Chinese quickly turned towards fear of Chinese and China. Um, there was a recession in 1870, and then the diseases of malaria, where's my little light? Oh, there it is. Um, smallpox and leprosy were seen to be specters of death emanating out of San Francisco Chinatown. So the fear was again, Chinese were disease carriers, and not only were we stereotyped as disease carrying, but we were filthy and immoral, so we were heathen, defiling America's Christendom, and we were ruined to white labor, so we were stealing white workers' jobs, right? And so in that way, um, white Americans became fearful of Asians, politicians stoked up that fear, and eventually, um, you know, we passed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. That Law, though, didn't actually quell violence, but it actually sanctioned violence. And this is going to be a repeat of history, that government policies and political leadership actually stir up interpersonal violence. So in 1885, um, there was a period of what I call the Yellow Terror, where 168 Chinese communities were actually driven out from the West Coast by mob violence. So here you see the mayor of Tacoma organized a turnout and drove out 900 Chinese from that city. 
This is a photograph of Monterey, California, where my great-grandparents settled for four decades. But because of racism, a fire burned down the entire Pacific Grove Point Alonis village. Um, and my great-grandparents, who had built a, a thriving business, had homes, had a family, they had to move to San Francisco Chinatown as the only place of refuge from racism back then. So they saw everything, their entire life burned down that night. And so you can imagine that trauma of being displaced by mob violence. Newspapers said onlookers were cheering as looters pillaged the village the next morning. And it was, this was a picture of it. In the 1920s, again, China was weak. The US passed an immigration act that barred the entire area of Asia with the Asiatic bar. Um, zone, and so they continue to exclude not only Chinese but Asians, again, for being disease carriers and for being illegal aliens. So <clears throat> Asians then were mass detained. The policy was we were mass detained. In Europe, migrants were um, stopped at Ellis Island and were processed in two to three hours and allowed to disembark. Chinese and Asians, on the other hand, were kept on average for two to three weeks under locked barracks and armed guards, and they had to go through lengthy interrogations and severe medical checkups. So that's really traumatizing for Chinese women, right, to strip naked before white men. It's traumatizing for my grandmother to have to go through an interrogation. Um, records show that they had to answer 56 questions in alignment with my grandfather, or else she would have been deported back. So. Um, being imprisoned, having to be interrogated, having to strip naked, that was the experience of my family and Chinese back then. 5% of Chinese never made it to San Francisco, but were deported back from Angel Island. Then World War II hit, and you could see the conditional status of Chinese and um, other Asians. Japan was the enemy because of World War II, um, Pearl Harbor bombing, and so again you see Japanese were seen as the yellow peril, they were seen as the enemy within, and they faced mass incarceration of 120,000. Chinese though, China was at war with Japan, so the enemy of the US's enemy was the friend of the US, right? China became the ally of the US, and so the United States had to um, repeal the Chinese Exclusion Act to demonstrate that allyship. So the US-China relations sort of shifted the fortunes of Chinese in the US, but hurt the, um, the standing of Japanese Americans. But then China, after World War II, became communist and became the People's Republic of China. And um, the US then, again, had a um, thought of China as the enemy, and Chinese and American were seen as spies and as communists. And so all family relations had to stop between China and the U.S., and Chinatowns here in the U.S. became segregated communities. Um, again, um, they were segregated from the rest of the United States, but they couldn't have relations with China, so they were really isolated communities. And so here you can see, this is San Francisco, um, my dad is here playing basketball at Kizar Stadium. And you can see how many Chinese were in the, the, the stadium for a Chinese basketball tournament. That's because the community was so segregated from sports, from news, that Chinatown had to create its own institutions, right? Um, so because of animosity with China, um, Chinese Americans, again, we're in this liminal state. And you can think about the difficulty of not being able to communicate with family for decades because China was communist. Fortunes changed again with US-China relations in the 1970s. Um, relations became normalized so then families could reunite. China was in favor. Um, we normalized relations in 2000. So then there was a lot more transnational interactions, right? And so my mom could finally go back to her ancestral village. She could finally go see the ancestral shrine. She could finally meet her cousins for the first time. My, my grandmother, though, when she um, had a reunion with her brother, 
My mom said she was really afraid because she didn't know what to say. She didn't know how to act with her brother who she, you know, she was separated for, for decades because she was fearful that if he said anything, he could get imprisoned in China. If she said anything wrong, she could get you know, deported back to China from the US. But as you know now, <clears throat> antagonism with China has hit a Cold War status. You know now that because of COVID-19 and um, with Trump using the term Chinese virus, that Chinese were really scapegoated for the disease and then faced that racist backlash. And that as we increase um, antagonism with China, um, things are going to continue to get worse. So I'm really concerned now. I've seen how much COVID-19 racism there is, and you know, the previous speaker spoke about it. I'm actually worried now that if we have a, a military conflict with China, or any skirmish, the backlash against Chinese is going to be even worse. That's because US-China foreign relations and foreign policy translates into American race relations policy in the US. There's a direct correlation between our foreign policy with Asian Americans' um, racial status. And that China bashing leads to the bashing of Chinese people and those who look like them. There was a recent study um, where um, these people surveyed those who saw China as a threat. And Americans who saw China as a threat were much more likely to have negative stereotypes about Chinese people. They saw them as immoral and untrustworthy. These people then, um, who saw China as a threat, also couldn't distinguish between Chinese in the US and Chinese in America. So they transferred those negative stereotypes to Chinese Americans. Furthermore, they can't tell Chinese Americans from other Asian Americans. So the entire community of Asian Americans get homogenized. There's that racial lumping. So the China threat translates into racism against Asian Americans overall. So this is how Asian Americans are being um, <clears throat> racialized today. Sometimes, and this you, most of you know about this, those of you who've taken our classes on Asian American studies, um, sometimes Asians are insiders and belong to the U.S. We're the model minority. We're crazy rich Asians. We belong. But in times of war, such as World War II, when Japanese Americans were incarcerated, or after 9-11, when South Asians, Arabs, Muslims faced Islamophobia, in times of economic distress, such as when Vincent Chin was killed for being mistaken as Japanese by white auto workers, and they blamed Japan for their economic distress, and in times of pandemic, Asians are seen more and more as perpetual foreigners, as the yellow peril, to be excluded. And so Asians are really racialized and treated differently than the way blacks are in the US. It's a different type of, race, of racism. And so we have to unpack and actually uproot the, the particular source of racism against Asians, just the same way we have to sort of uproot the anti-blackness in our society. So you're following me, right? <clears throat> the US-China relations, the yellow peril fear um, is stoked up with COVID, that we're disease carriers, is stoked up by economic conditions that we're stealing um, white people's jobs. And that's why um, this fear of trade with China is really problematic. The impacts now continue today, and history is repeating itself. Just this month, TikTok has been banned, and they're blaming TikTok as, you know, a stooge for the PRC. In Florida, this week, they just banned Chinese from being able to purchase land. Um, there's now in Congress a proposal that every federal agency appoint a staff person to identify undue competition from China. That point person has the right and the responsibility to investigate any person who has um, undue relationships with China. So if you have economic relationships, political relationships, or even familial relationships, that point person is supposed to profile us 
investigate us, and then could again deport us, detain us. So these policies, it's, it's not just Trump, you know, cutting refugee resettlement or extending the Muslim ban or banning Chinese scientists and researchers. These are all policies going on currently that are yellow peril policies that see Asians as a threat, that see us as endangering the nation's public health, endangering the nation's uh, national security. And so um, these policies will then impact the general population. It'll sanction and legitimate people on the ground to discriminate against Asians. Economically, we've been hard hit by racism. Um, during COVID, Asian businesses dropped 60%. That's five times more than other businesses. And because those businesses closed, 83%, 8 out of 10 Californian Asians had to file for unemployment. And for you, you're all mental health um, specialists, you know, you've probably seen that um, the racism has had a negative impact on our community's mental health. I say they're having a period of collective racial trauma. Those who have direct racism experiences are not feeling safe and thus avoiding places and not going to necessary appointments, even doctor's appointments. Um, there's actually been 50 studies at least now that have documented the strong correlation between racism and psychological distress among Asians of all ages. And um, Stop API Hate study found that when asked their greatest source of stress during the pandemic, Asian Americans um, overwhelmingly say racism is their greatest fear. Oh, for the pandemic that's killed a million people. Right? We're afraid of our neighbor more than we are of a pandemic that's killed a million people. So just think about that. You know, we can mask against COVID, but you can't vaccinate against someone who pushes your grandma around. One other new stat is that one half of Asian Americans feel unsafe right now because of their race. So you look at the room, it's like half of us. It's not like we're always fearful, but we have that unsettling fear. That's the norm. And then for the other half, you know, it's like, why aren't you worried? And for me, you know, that fear is so normalized that I, you know, it shapes me. I don't go out at night. I live in Oakland. I don't. I watch where I park, right? If you're a female, my wife watches out when she stands on the bar platforms, right? And that just becomes our normal way of life. But, it, you know, if you come from Asia, that's really abnormal, right? You don't have to walk around with so much fear. You don't have to walk around with fear of guns or of your neighbors. But that's how the Asian American community is living right now. We're actually under trauma, and we're not even aware of it. You know, it's just become part of our day-to-day -day fearful existence. And this collective racial trauma, then, really, as we know, um, impacts us. We go into a fight-or-flight response here and then we pass it on to our kids. And I know because of what we've gone through, what I've seen um, during COVID-19, I've been traumatized and I've actually acted out of fight or flight response a lot too. I have these experiences of um, angry outbursts and um, it could be intergenerational. Again, because you know, you've heard from the history my own family, we experienced mass exclusion, mass displacement, mass segregation, mass detention, mass deportation, family separation. My family experienced all that. And so when my dad got angry, <clears throat> I go, what? That's sort of weird. And I said, I'd never, I'll never be like my dad, right? But now, in similar situations, I'm exactly like my dad, and I can't help it. I act out in sort of undo, unexpected responses um, that aren't called for for the situation. I sort of react from past experience, not from the current situation, right? And that's a trauma response. And it's really harmed, not me, but it harmed those around me, my family and colleagues, right? So I know I'm acting out of this 
trauma. And I don't want to blame my family. I'm responsible for my actions, right? So I don't want to say, oh, I could just blame everything on racism and racial trauma. I have to deal with how I react. But I know that's part of the cause of why I get so angry in certain situations. And my fear is my kid is going to just act like me, just the way I act just like my dad. Right? And you could think of situations where you go into a fight response, get angry more than you need to, or when you withdraw more than you need to. It's that trauma. And the Asian community now is going into fight or flight response to the threat of racism. Um, we're buying guns at high rates, and we're self-isolating. So I know most of you have probably told your elders, stay inside right, during COVID-19, because it's not safe. But there's another response um, in terms of how we're resisting the racism, another sort of culturally adaptive way that I think is very Asian American culturally, that is actually resilient. There's another response to racism and its threat that I think is actually really powerful and actually really healing. And so this is what I want to propose, propose to you and those of you who do researchers, maybe we could study this, is that instead of going into fight or flight response, our community is flocking. So I've seen our community really stand up against the racism. We've had vigils to grieve together. We've had rallies to support one another, to build allyship. We've gone back to Chinatowns and Clement Street to help depressed businesses. We've created chaperone programs to protect our elders. We've held fundraisers to support community agencies like Rams. We've flocked um, across the nation, across generations, across ethnicity along with our allies, to combat the racism. And that's a healthy way to respond. I've seen young people really flock. At Stop API Hate, we had a, a call out, and within a week we gathered 100 youth across the nation. They created their own community-based uh, participatory research policy report. They interviewed 1,000 peers, and their policy recommendations became the basis of Congresswoman Grace Meng's um, legislation for ethnic studies. These middle schoolers flocked, and they organized a 1,200-person rally in Berkeley. And now Youth Uprising, um, they have 70 chapters across the nation. Mina here just met with President Biden. And because they flocked, there's been a national movement for ethnic studies and Asian American studies. Because we've flocked, we've gained political power, we've been put on the agenda of mainstream media, we've gotten on the agenda of policymakers, and so Congress passed hate crimes legislation almost unanimously. In California, we funded $156 million to stop AAPI hate. So that flocking has helped us with our mental health interpersonally, that flocking has empowered us politically, and this flocking has built a global movement. We got Steph Curry, sorry the Warriors were out of the playoffs now, but um, <laughs> Steph Curry did a public service now to stop AAPI hate. When BTS, they were just at the Oakland Coliseum last night, and not BTS, but one of them. <laughs> yes, yeah, Suda, thank you. <laughs> just trying to like, oh yeah, BTS. When BTS tweeted, stop AAPI hate, that became the most retweeted post in the world. So this is a global movement of us flocking together, not just for our mental health, but to fight for racial justice for all of us, right? So to conclude, um, I have three quick recommendations. We have to identify flocking as a protective and healing mechanism that is culturally appropriate and responsive for our community and has actually been known to be evidence-based effective. So social support, community engagement, <coughs> task sharing um, is a way where we can um, reach Asians where they already are and um, support them. 
So <laughs> I love that line from B for Western therapy doesn't work for Eastern minds, right? Because Western therapy, you all know, is so individualistic. It's all about talk therapy. We're not going to talk about our problems. That's re-traumatizing. But when we flock and come together, we know someone has our back and supports us, even if we don't talk about it, right? And that we can be healed in different ways by coming together. <clears throat> also, it's known that religious coping, um, ethnic coping strategies are actually effective. You know, um, there's a study globally, multinationally, where people go through the same trauma experience, like earthquakes or airplane disasters, right? But Asians actually ex are more resilient against that trauma. So there, we know there's something in our Asian backgrounds that are protective. There's something in our Asian um, heritage that's helpful. And so I really encourage you to really look at Asian traditions as a source of resource, uh, strength. So I know our young people are already saying, oh, we've got to talk more about mental health. We've got to destigmatize mental health. And our young people want our elders to talk more about their issues. And that's fair. But at the same time, I want our young people to learn from our elders that they've gone through trauma like war, like poverty, like migration. And so there's a lot of wealth to be gained from our religious traditions. Um, we just did a, um, well, we didn't do a study, but we've interviewed religious elders from a bunch of variety of Asian faiths, from Buddhism, Filipino Catholicism, Christianity. And um, because of their religious traditions, it gave them practices that are really helpful, like chanting, like meditation, like singing. And it gave them group flocking mechanisms to gain social support, right? By praying together, by um, indirectly talking to God. And so I think, um, as mental health um, professionals, again, task sharing, working with these community um, sites that are actually the first responders to trauma would be really be advantageous. And finally, there's the notion of post-traumatic growth. Um, yeah, there it is. So yeah, our community is going through racial trauma. And yes, some of us have post-traumatic stress. But the hope is that most people actually come through. Our elders have survived and not, are they, dis, they are not disordered from their post-traumatic stress, but rather a lot of us have grown from the trauma. We survived the trauma and we've actually become stronger because of the trauma. People who've gone through trauma and have growth have greater appreciation for life. They have more empathetic relationships. They have more purpose because they have renewed an, a second chance. And I think that's the opportunity for our community now. We're hurt people, and through intergenerational trauma, we can continue to hurt people. So hurt people hurt people like the way I do with my angry outbursts. But the good news is, and what I'm really appreciative for all of you, is that healed people heal people. And the Asian American community now is poised, if we could deal with this collective racial trauma in this moment, if we could learn to talk to our young people about it, they can be healed people who heal other people. We, can, we don't have to become anti-white and anti-black and perpetuate the cycle of racism. We can actually learn to be anti-racist and show and model for the rest of the United States how to be restored people who restore others, who bring unity, who don't um, use fear to create divisions, but instead use hope, use resilience, use healing to support one another. So thank you for being those healers, for being on the front lines, and for uh, joining me today, for flocking with me today. <laughs> <laughs>
So we'll do like a five minute Q&A. Uh, if people have any questions, then we'll just walk over and hand the mic to you all. I, I see in the President Biden sign it, uh, something that you, that might relate to the hatred and the, the grant that might relate that to support or how is those numbers going to use for us? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that about President Biden? And... You have one picture that President Biden signed something to a law and give uh, 160 something money. Oh yeah. And what are those money going or how they funnel to the AAI? Okay, so the federal legislation is hate crimes legislation that funds states to um, document it better and to um, have better reporting. Sorry. Um, and then the the California Equity Budget Bill funds um, community groups. So they just funded 80 community groups across the nation, to across the state, to address racism. And um, they're just beginning their programs now. But um, there's going to be another cycle, so your agencies can apply as well. Hi, good morning. Anthony from My Sister's House. Um, I have a quick question for you in terms of the model minority myth. How, as a professor of you know, San Francisco State University, how do you think that the model minority myth has impacted Southeast Asian Americans and tribal indigenous communities of Asian descent? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, that's a great question. So the question is uh, how has the model minority operated, especially affect Southeast Asians and indigenous communities? And the model minority myth, again, is that Asians are hardworking and achieving. And one thing it does is it masks the issues in our community, right? And that's why we don't get funding. That's why um, our issues get ignored. And so for Southeast Asian communities and smaller Pacific Islander communities, um, it really invisibilizes a lot of their issues. And um, because they're lumped in with other Asians, um, their critical concerns aren't met. And so the model minority is really dangerous to our communities um, in that we don't get resources for our needs. It's also really problematic because it drives a wedge between us and other communities of color, right? So right now, in Florida, they pass anti-CRT bills, right? They pass legislations that Chinese can't buy land. They're proposing all these racist, they're not proposing, they're passing all this racist land legislation. At the same time, they passed Asian American Studies, K through 12. So they go, that's sort of weird, right? Why do they pass Asian American Studies when they're passing all this other racist legislation? And for me, they're just using Asian Americans as saying, look at, we're not racist against Asians. We're just, we support their contributions because they're a model minority, right? They're helping build our nation, whereas these other groups are more problematic. And that's the danger of the model minority stereotypes. It creates a wedge between us, and it uses Asian Americans to keep other groups down. It masks the racial disparities and inequities in our nation. It, 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 um, the model minority maintains the inequities that Southeast Asians and PIs face. So it is um, something we have to really address. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. I greatly enjoyed it. Um, Corey Kafaro, SAMHSA. Um, if you could distill in maybe one or two or three key recommendations that I could take back to the policy folks in health and human services, how can we take these recommendations and put it into actual actions? Um, 
All right, the first policy recommendation everybody makes is, well, we just have to disaggregate the data so that we can identify um, the differences between the ethnic groups, and but that's overused. I'm sort of sick of it. Um, it's not a really good call to action. You know, it's like, the, the disaggregation, that's the Asian Americans' main you know, issue. But, but that is actually really useful. What I think is actually really um, needed, and this is, takes a real paradigmatic shift, we all know that Asian Americans are the racial group who least utilize mental health services, right? So let's not use mental health services, sorry you guys, um, as a way to, to promote community well-being. Let's have mental health services connect with where Asian Americans are already at and do your outreach work there. And so I think, again, first responders are places like ESL classes, right? That's where Asian immigrants are at. They're at temples, they're at churches, <clears throat> but you can't get insurance um, to serve the mental health needs of Asians at these sites. You can only do them at health facilities. So a big paradigmatic shift is realize that mental health shouldn't be delivered in individual talk therapy ways the way white people get it. We can't I love that thing. Western therapy doesn't meet Eastern minds. You gotta provide mental health the way Asians want mental health. We want our mental health through flocking. We want it through social support. We don't want to talk about our mental health and re-traumatize ourselves, but we do want to deal with it. We want to be happy. We want to avoid the somaticization of our pains. And so, um, I think you've got to really rethink mental health and be able to provide mental health services to a community that feels unsafe, to a community that feels lost, to a community that is depressed, right? So we do have mental health issues, but how we deal with those mental health issues, how we perceive them, how we could get service for them, have to be centering on the Asian American perspective. And so how do you create culturally responsive services? You go to the people where they're at using their own thinking and their own sort of mindset. I don't know how to make that a policy, except for we gotta figure out the better funding mechanisms to deliver mental health. We have to um, get mental health workers out into the community rather than being at a mental health clinic that nobody wants to go to, you know? So you gotta rethink how we do mental health in a real meaningful way for Asian Americans. I mean, you guys probably talk about this all the time, right? And so, um, so for me, that's a big thing. How Asians deal with racial trauma is really different from how blacks deal with racial trauma. And the only, a lot of understanding about racial trauma is from African American research. And it's valid for African Americans, but we have to have more Asian American research that centers on us, that doesn't borrow from dominant therapeutic models. So, um, I don't know what it looks like, but I just want to rethink um, these ideas about talk therapy, its effectiveness for Asians. Um, look at, again, what are our cultural assets, and let's build on our cultural assets, rather than saying, oh, we need to destigmatize mental health. Oh, um, we're just not talking about it. We're too shame-based. Well, maybe shame is good. Maybe not talking about it is good. Maybe all these things of quietness actually have <laughs> given us I don't know, I don't know. It may not be true, but you know. Let's rethink mental health from an Asian perspective. Thank you so much. Um, I can say that these conversations are starting to happen, but we're, we're not quite there yet, but I agree with you. Yeah, it's hard to come up with policies. Hi, Mimi Locke from Voice of Witness. Um, so my wheelhouse is oral history and storytelling, and to your earlier points about negative uh, narrative representations of particularly Chinese, um, I'm very much a subscriber of what Viet Thanh Nguyen often calls narrative expansiveness, right? So that there's room for a multitude of stories that challenge monolithic stereotypes of Asians in, in this country. And that includes complicated, difficult, not always flattering portrayals, right? Um, and I'm curious just for you personally, what is a specific story 
that hasn't been told yet that you would love to see represented either in mainstream media, in books, in the classroom? I'm just curious from your, from your point of view as an educator, but also just as a human being. Yeah, um, so the question is, what we need to combat stereotypes isn't a counter stereotype and saying, oh, we're not the model minority, look at Southeast Asians. I always found that problematic. I don't know why, because we're obviously like, Chinese have, you know, people who are poor with mental illness and stuff. So the way you combat stereotypes is with through narrative plenitude that tell our whole story in a variety of ways. And one story, I, want, I don't want to tell the crazy rich Asian story. I just, um, we just, my students and I just talked about that. This, so my students worked with the Filipino Community Center and they did, um, they did focus groups with um, domestic workers. And the issues they face with inflation, a be able to send remittance back to the Philippines and um, the struggles they have with the high cost of living. But he argued, or he, he found that these workers who are seniors love flocking, they love getting together to talk about their stories and their struggles. And now these women who are, you know, again, some undocumented are now coming together to work with other domestic workers and going to the state to fight for the rights of their community. That's the story I want heard, is how normal people, especially our Asian grandmas who go recycling, um, our powerful women who use flocking to take care of their families. And, I, and I, that's the story of my grandmother. That's the story of a lot of us. That's the story I, I'd like to share. Thank you. Hi, Professor Zhang. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm so I'm a Chinese that was born and raised in China, and I came here around 10 years ago. And I, through providing mental health to, um, I would say like, China, second or third generation Chinese, I find that there are differences between my culture, like how I, my experiences gr growing up in China and um, Chinese or Asian, um, I would say second or third generations here. Um, so I'm curious, like for me, what the, I would say the racism I experience most, I, I can think of right away, is the immigration policy. How, like there are, it, it takes many more years for Chinese and Indians to get green card here. So we don't really have that much energy to really learn how like, I don't think I know enough about how uh, Chinese, American-born Chinese, what kind of discrimination they experience here. So I, I think there is some barrier for me to provide mental health to them. So I'm curious, for you, uh, as a many, like a, a who, who was born and raised here, what, it, what are some stories you experience as um, a, a, a Chinese that uh, discrimination you experienced growing up? Uh, as a Chinese in America. Yeah, thanks. So, <clears throat> again, the, um, we experience different types of discrimination based on our intersectional identities, right? So what I experience may be different from what a female experience, what an immigrant experiences is different from what a, a native English speaker may experience. And yeah, I think you're right. One of the big institutional policies that discriminate against Asians is our immigration policy, right? So those from Asia have a longer wait for visas, and it's a disparate income. It's not intended, but it is, you know, an institutional inequality. Um, so what? <clears throat> um, oh, and again, the racism that like immigrants face. It's, they're not covered by civil rights laws again, because civil rights laws are based on a white black binary from the 1960s. And so again, this particular racism that Asians face being perceived as outsiders, being um, citizens and eligible for citizenship, that's not covered. And so when, when people pick on us for our language, you know, that's often not covered by certain states. So I think um, Asian Americans have to recognize that a lot of the issues that 
middle class American born Asians want to address, like the glass ceiling and corporations, aren't the issues affecting other Asians like sex trafficking, right? Or like wage theft. And so there's really class differences in our community, gender differences and ethnic differences. For me, um, a lot of my students say, oh, I've never faced discrimination. I don't face racism. No one's yelled at me, right? For me, one of the prime examples of institutional racism is in our curriculum, right? So I grew up never knowing anything about Asian American history, and all we learned was the history of white males, right? And so what that taught me is that I don't belong in this nation, I have no role models, and that this country is for white people. And um, that's because Asians are actually erased from American history, right? And the histories of communities of color are also erased. And so for me, that's something that really, well, it didn't really, but it did impact me because it shaped what I aspire to. It shaped my sense of belonging here in the US. It shaped um, who I thought was really American. And again, that's based on our curriculum. It's our state policy and education. But that impacted me. Um, so that's just one example of how I think a lot of us experience racism. It's just in what we learn in our schools. And that's why we need to push for ethnic studies. Okay, I gotta wrap up. So, okay, I just wanna end with one, one sort of final factoid or data point. When traumatized and experienced during COVID-19, Asian young people experience and report a lot more trauma than elders, even though they're going through same experiences and even though elders seem to be more vulnerable in terms of their health and safety. So why is it that Asian American young people are reporting more trauma? And it could be that they're just more attuned to their emotions because they grew up in the United States. It could be because they have a, a mindset, an understanding, and a concept, conceptualization of mental health and what trauma is, and they could report it better, right? But it could also be that our Asian American elders are more resilient and that they actually have protective cultural resources that they draw upon that help them. Again, it's based on their expectations. Asians come from long centuries of trauma and surviving it and growing from it. They have expectation maybe of suffering through karma or through fate, right? And so when you get hard hit, you're not shocked and think, oh, why is someone yelling at me? Elders could say, duh, what do you expect from America, right? And so the impact may not be as startling. Our young people say they're really disappointed and angry at America because they didn't expect America to be this way. But our elders are like, what do you expect, you know, white country? And so, I think, um, again, I also want to lift up our elders and our Asian traditions that they are rich resources of resilience, healing, and support. I encourage you to utilize them. I know you are, and um, one of them is blocking, so thank you again. <laughs>